Congratulations on your appointment, uh, Chairman Brownsberger, your reappointment, and I know there's new members of the committee. Congratulations to you. Uh, I come before you, um, uh, Representative Mark and I, offering um, this amendment to distinguish corporations from individuals in the realm of free speech uh, in terms of money spent on elections. And um, the amendment distinguishes money from speech and protects the legislature's right to regulate money in elections. Um, I don't think any of us doubt that Citizens United has changed uh, campaign finance in America. Uh, money's always been a problem in politics, and, uh, but Citizens United has dramatically exacerbated that problem, in my opinion. Uh, the coming presidential election, for example, we're told may well be determined by billions of dollars. Uh, the latest number I heard uh, on the Clinton campaign is the estimate it could rise as high as 2.5 billion. I think uh, President Obama's initial election cost uh, a billion, either the 2008 or the 2012 election. Uh, these numbers are staggering, and the challenge is the money could be drawn from a very narrow group of people, very wealthy individuals that get to funnel their money to super PACs and spend on advertisements. So I believe we need to amend the U.S. Constitution ultimately. But we can start here in Massachusetts and send a powerful message to the country. Uh, I think this is an important step. I hope the committee gives this uh, its full attention. And thank you for listening. And I know other representatives want to speak. Well, I thank you to the committee for taking us out of turn, both uh, Chair people. Uh, I echo uh, Representative Rogers' remarks and have, uh, have really uh, personally engaged with a number of my constituents on this issue who are uh, very, very concerned about money uh, from out of our state uh, coming in uh, to our elections and uh, money, uh, small, narrow-minded money uh, affecting elections across the country. So because they support it and I've met with them, I support it uh, myself too. And I would uh, very much appreciate the, uh, the committee's timely review of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I'm, I'm here uh, in an unusual uh, way. I don't usually come and, and personally testify on bills that I have co-sponsored. But I really believe that this is one of the most important things we can do is to try to solve this problem about money in politics. Um, I believe the money, the enormous amounts of money that are going into elections is uh, going to affect whatever you care about. If you care about the environment, if you care about the judiciary, if you care about education, whatever your issue is, money in politics is skewing the results of what we can do as a people. And this, I agree with Representative Rogers and Re Representative Mark that we, this should get changed on the federal level. That's a better solution. I don't have a lot of confidence 
that that's going to happen on the federal level. I don't have a lot of confidence in what's happening in Washington. Massachusetts often leads the way on what's right in this country, and I think that we need to take this opportunity to lead the way and get po uh, money out of politics. Money is not speech. It should never be looked at as speech, especially in the political world. I very much appreciate your time and your consideration, and I put myself at your service in whatever we can do to get this thing done. Thank you very much. Are there questions from members of the panel for this distinguished panel? Thanks for the question. It's a great question. And uh, I should say uh, at the outset that uh, if the committee, uh, in terms of wordsmithing, wants to uh, amend what we've written or thinks that it conflicts with any other state law, then I think the advocates for this, including the legislators who've introduced it, myself and Paul Mark and others, are open to that. I, I happen to be a corporate lawyer, a business lawyer. I've spent most of my career before getting elected doing that. And in Massachusetts, we have a corporation statute, uh, Chapter 156, that sets out, it, it, it enumerates, lists all the rights of corporations. Um, I don't think this would preclude or, or conflict with the corporation statute. But if you do, then I certainly uh, wouldn't uh, have issues with drafting. Well, 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 what if a corporation isn't made up of people, what is it made up of? In other words, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I, I really do look for your uh, for your input. It's made up of I thought stockholders. Right. Now, stockholders could be other corporations, but they could also be people. And I happen to be involved in some small corporations. So when you take people out of that realm. I just think the consequences of that could be far reaching. Now, now maybe, they, maybe, maybe it's just as simple as just changing it the way you suggest, but to me it seems like it might be more impact than just that. But, but I, I would uh, like to see what kind of input you have on that. Yeah, but again, I, I appreciate this line of inquiry because it's an important conversation. Uh, the term of art a lot of lawyers use when they refer to corporations is that corporations are a legal fiction meaning they are under 50 state statutes, we grant corporations limited liability. So if all of us in this room were entrepreneurs, we banded together to form a corporation and we build a product and the product injures people, the corporation can be sued for product liability. You and I cannot. So, we, we're, so we're giving limited liability to the corporation, a special right as a legal fiction. And um, so it is not a person. In, in that sense, it is a is an entity, and um, you know it probably could fill law review journals from here to the ceiling with with this conversation and, and sort of the debate back and forth. I uh, I appreciate your concern, uh, but I, I do not think uh, that corporations are people in the sense that you and I understand what a person is. So that might be the case, so, but if you were to sue as a corporate lawyer in another state that didn't have this kind of legislation, what impact would that have on your legal rights as, as an attorney? Would it have any legal rights? Would it not allow you to sue if you in Massachusetts have defined a corporation differently? I don't know the answer. I'm just really looking for some guidance on this. Well, again, I think all the 50 states have their own corporation statute, as well as limited liability companies, limited partnerships, general partnerships. The statutes and case law lay out the rights of corporations, uh, and I don't think it would have this language any ability to impede 
the corporation's right to sue, be sued, own property. I mean, there's literally, if you look at the Massachusetts Corporation Statute, it lists what all the rights of corporations are. So, uh, are you Money's different. Spending money on elections, what this amendment is saying, is different. And to, I've always thought, I know I've had rich conversations with the chair, uh, very, you know, interesting, stimulating conversations that I, that I enjoy philosophically, but as a, as a practical matter, what we're saying is, how can under state charter you get limited liability and protection, but then this unlimited ability to spend money? Now, the whole line of jurisprudence, going back to, I think, Buckley versus Vallejo at the United States Supreme Court, has uh, decided these cases on free speech grounds. It's not, it didn't begin with Citizens United. I mean, Buckley versus Vallejo, it goes back, I think, to 1976 is that case. Um, I've disagreed with it from the start. I think they've got the jurisprudence wrong on that from the get-go. And this notion that, well, if you say corporations aren't people, then are you saying that, what about the New York Times Company? That's a corporation. They have free speech rights. Fine, let's draft it in a way that carves out media companies. I mean, there are ways to solve the problem uh, other than to throw our hands up and say, well, you know, uh, it's so problematic we can't do it. Are you also concerned that uh, it seems that you focus on corporation money? I think that's what you, you mentioned, that there's all kinds of money. Is there a concern that you have also that, that unions spend money? Is, is that also a concern, or are we only concerned about how corporations, and you want to redefine corporations, which I understand you have right to the, but are you also concerned about unions and how they spend money? Yes. Okay. How yes. Matter of fact, I, I, I mean, uh, it's. It's, it's very odd because they spent money on my election. And unbeknownst to me, they're not allowed to coordinate their independent expenditure. Um, you know, but yes, I, I think, uh, Representative Lyons, the reason, though, that in our public discourse, corporations usually get the emphasis is, and I do think unions should be similarly restricted, is they've got the money <laughs> much more than, than unions. Well, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, that, that you say that, but I'll go back to a specific election in 2012 where the unions in Massachusetts, public employee union, teachers union, SEIU unions, put $190,000 into an account to open up a, an account to attack, you know, politicians in Massachusetts, so that's a lot of money. So if we're if we're really trying to address the issue of fairness, maybe we ought to talk about how that happens also. And, and I don't dispute that you, you probably want that to happen. Can we do that with this legislation? Is there a way to make this legislation to put unions in the same category? I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah. Question I, again. I think it should. I think it should apply to unions. I, I also think there is a difference between small individual contributions from individual members of a union than uh, nameless, faceless super PACs, where we don't know who the contributors are. In Massachusetts, fortunately, we've now required the disclosure. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Election. You see the five top donors are at the bottom of the screen. But, um, no, but if I can interrupt you just for a second. Sure. I mean, the, I'm not talking about nameless, faceless donors. I'm talking about $75,000 checks. The Mass Teachers Union. Right, we know who they are, though. We know. We know this the Mass Teachers Association. So you're only concerned about who they are, not necessarily who their donors are. Well, I think that that's a big concern is this is the secretiveness of super PACs. But again, we've dealt with that at the state level. But but I I, I think you make a fair point. Thank you. Big money is a problem when it's unregulated, and uh, so. Thank you, individually, it's 
susceptible, but not if they are doing it in the presence of sort of the administration, like the corporate officers, you know, are, are making this huge donation through a super PAC, or the Mass Teachers Association is writing the check. But if the individual, I mean, which I, I think is already okay, the individual teachers could make their own donations if they so choose. So, um, the, so I, I would think the only difference is by allowing the unions to do it, you're taking away the individual ability, just like to allow a corporation to do it. All of those people that work for the public corporation aren't making the decision, just the top is making the decision, and they're just doing their job as they normally do. So it does seem like there's a parallel there. Um, so I, I guess I don't understand why you wouldn't say unions cannot make, their union members are allowed to make those donations, but not the unions themselves. It, doesn't that seem the same as the corporation? Yeah, I think you make a fair point. I think um, the language we've drafted says corporations are not people. Maybe, you know, it, I, I certainly, you know, I confer with the advocates I'm working with on the issue, but I, I would be open to the idea that it should be, we'll right. get into dra legal drafting, unions, entities. And, 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 and I say this only because I have a very good friend who is a um, very supportive of mine. She's, she's a Republican and she's a school teacher. So she says her union dues go to sometimes support candidates she would never support. So her free, her free right to support who she wants is sort of taken away by the fact that she has to pay those dues, and then they determine who gets that money. Right, well, again, I think there are two issues there. One is the unlimited spending versus PAC contributions, and uh, this is not addressing what, under current law, I think the limit is $500, and uh, this does not get into contribution limits uh, that a union might make under, under the PAC rules. Um, but I think in terms of unlimited spending, um, I'd be open to tweaking the language we have now to address your concerns that unions should be covered as well. Thank you. Um, Other questions for this panel? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Um, so let's see. Uh, now we're going to continue to go through the uh, people who signed up to testify on House Number 33 in New York. And we have, and I believe, the first two are Nick Bofron and Charles Friedrichs. Welcome back. Hi, cheers, members of the committee. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to help the citizens to voice their concern on this issue. My name is Nick Boker and I live in the Hunt. I'm a local 7 I am worker. I'm with Past Mass Amendment. I was hoping to base my discussion, go briefly about the corporations and our people part and jump into a little history and then money is not speech. I feel at this point I should address some of the questions that were previously stated here. We're in two parts. The first part, corporations are not people and may be regulated. With a corporation, when you incorporate, you follow your articles of a corporation, you set up a wall between the corporation and the individuals. The corporation gets limited liability, liability eternal life, and the citizens of the individuals, all they can lose is the, the original investment. So that wall is set up. It separates the individual from the corporation itself. Now, what the corporations are doing is they're going after the individual's rights. They're reaching back through that barrier and they're grabbing constitutional rights of individuals which they were never entitled to. The second part about the unions, the unions are not doing this. The unions are not grabbing any constitutional rights as a corporation is doing. With the unions, if you're concerned about unions, they will fall under the second part where the money is not speech and that will be about everybody. The first part is basically saying that corporations are not people. They have no free speech rights. Those are the rights of individuals. It's a constitutional right, and they do not have that right. And I'd like to, to start on that also about um, in Massachusetts, we're already Article 59 of the Massachusetts Constitution. Basically, um, 
every charter franchise or active incorporation shall forever remain subject to revo revocation and amendment. Now, if a corporation had any constitutional rights in Massachusetts, that would have to be done by a constitutional amendment to take away any rights, change their rights, or whatever. As it stands, between that and uh, Mass General Law 153, the legislature has the right to change the corporation and it and their charter, amend their charter, do whatever they want. So basically, as far as the way I read it, if a corporation had any constitutional rights in Massachusetts, that would have to be done by constitutional amendment, which is not the issue. The legislature has that right. So I'd like to do a, a brief history of Massachusetts, the Constitution, the charter, whatever, go in to talk about free speech, and then end up with the present time. In 1628, the Royal Charter was given to the Puritans. They held, they went to Cambridge and they had a meeting and they came up with what was called the Cambridge Agreement. During that, it was decided that all the shareholders would be going to the New World. So if you, were, if you wanted to stay in Europe, you had to sell your share of the company to the folks going to the New World. What the Crown didn't do when they gave the Charter was the state where the annual meeting was. So the Puritans, took the shareholders, they took the charter, and they came to the U.S. When they got here, the shareholders wanted to be freemen. They wanted to be acknowledged as freemen. That's accepted. They didn't all want to have to show up to Boston to help decide the laws. They decided to elect deputies to represent them. By 1644, Massachusetts, we had a representative democracy where the freemen now elected deputies, which became the House. The Senate back then was the assistants. You had to go through the House, the deputies and the assistants to make a law in the general court. So let's go to the, the Massachusetts Constitution now. Shot fired uh, heard around the world. During that time, we got a revolution going on. We had the, we used to have obey the crown laws or whatever. Now there's a space where we're not obeying their laws. We don't have our laws. The cry starts out in, in Western Mass. No constitution, no law. They were not letting judges sit and hear any cases or anything. The general court puts out, okay, do you folks want a constitution? Does everybody want a constitution? Yes, we do. We want a constitution. We want to be able to ratify it. We want to be able to comment it, on it, and we want to elect the delegates to the, the convention. The legislature went around to mean themselves into a convention, put forth a constitution, was resoundingly defeated by about a five to one margin. In Essex County, they had a convention to discuss what the problems were. They came up with the Essex results. It was chaired by Theophilus Parsons, later to become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. Basically, the big point was there was no Bill of Rights. There was some other confusion, whatever, that they uh, addressed, but the big thing was there was no Bill of Rights. At this point, the legislature takes the step of a constitutional convention. The towns elect the delegates, they have the convention, it's a committee of 30, elects a, commi a, a committee of three, who then another subcommittee of 30, I mean, a committee of 30 selects a committee of three, a subcommittee, who then selects a committee of one, John Adams, and we end up with our constitution. Not everything they wanted, close enough. They get the results, we now have our constitution. In our constitution, Article 21, free speech. Free speech was not throughout the Commonwealth. Free speech was in a place. It was in the House, and it was in the Senate. That's it. In Massachusetts, it wasn't until 1948 that the general public got free speech. Let me just highlight for you, you're so passionate. You spoke for about five minutes. Fair amount of number of people were Think about the question. People might cross me about myself with questions, so just think about it. So we're at the free speech part, Article 21 in the Houses. Everybody else got free speech in 1948. They added it on to freedom of the press. They didn't even mess with the most sacrosanct free speech that we have is deliberation and debate in the House. Yet, if I come in here today, I cannot give any money to a representative in the State House where the epitome of free speech is. I cannot even come in here with a sign, a political sign or anything. And here it was, there were not even any paid advertisements until a French paper in 1836. So, Back with that, the law since 1894, I cannot give any money to any representatives in the, the State House. We consider free speech not what, in the Constitution. Basically, what we're, we're trying to amend the Constitution, we consider it a clarification. 
we don't feel we're actually changing much here. If anything, it would just help folks with the ballot initiative. So now we get to the ratification. The big thing is the ratification of the U.S. Constitution with the House of Representatives, whether it should be one year or two year. Big uh, debate over that. We end up with two years. Here it is. The House of Representatives, our representatives, the people's representatives to the federal government get elected every two years. We just elected them, and they have a 15% approval rating. This, the, the system is broken. We're trying to amend the Massachusetts Constitution to clarify, to jumpstart the whole process of amending the U.S. Constitution. The problem isn't the Massachusetts Constitution. It's not the U.S. Constitution. It's the Supreme Court. The Citizens United decision has made it so the corporations, the, the money to lead, have now taken control of the U.S. Congress. The folks might as well be walking around with corporate logo patches on their, their suits like the race car drivers. At that point, the citizens are fed up. I mean, they want change. And I'd like to thank you all for giving me the time to speak, and Teva will take over. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nick. And if you didn't mention, he's an iron worker from Nahant and um, a fan of the Legal Law Library, right? Um, I would like to thank you for letting us speak to you, um, Chairman, Chairman, all that stuff. I'm not very good at that. It's all new, all new to me. Um, but I'd like to ask you if it's possible that the same people could ask the same questions of me when I'm done with my little speech. Is that possible? Maybe or can you? Oh, okay. But I have to speak to some of the points. I better. Okay. So uh, inal the, the difference is inalienable rights versus rights granted by the legislature. So corporations are given rights by you guys not by God. And so the inalienable part is the part that we want to make, we want to clarify, because we don't think that they ever had rights. You granted them some rights. So that's that part. Then uh, my father, who uh, owns a factory in Lowell, uh, pointed out to me that he works hard to separate himself, his person, from his corporations. So how dare a corporation then try to take inalienable, inalienable rights as well you have it one way or the other, boys. That's what he said to me. Choose which one. So that was his perspective. And then the other one is that the um, you mentioned the question about the limits and do we this and that. This is this is just about clarifying what we can do in the state of Massachusetts. We'll decide later about what limits and do that and the other thing. So this is just a simple way to assert your authority to effectively pr protect your right to regulate corporations at this state level. So now can I go for my speech? Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I'll go quickly, hopefully. Um, esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee, we are here to ask you to help us get big money out of our elections by clarifying the will of the people through the constitutional amendment process. As an elected official in my hometown of Acton, I remember the pain of wanting to do something to serve the will of the people, but having my hands tied by arcane laws. I remember the pain of not being able to do the right thing because of the fear of industry reprisal. The more I investigated why leaders in our town were afraid, why we did not feel we had control over our own government, the more I found out how industry leaders, consultants, and lobbyists set agendas at both the local and state levels. I was aghast at how much money poured in, not only for elections, but ballot initiatives and lobbying. I found industry agents sitting on important boards and committees drafting legislation which included very industry-friendly terms. I became determined to do something. I did all the traditional things, writing my letters, making phone calls, visiting my legislators. Too often I was told, there's nothing we can do because there's not enough support in the legislature. I asked how do we build that support and was told one legislator at a time. And when Occupy started, it occurred to me, here are the boots on the ground. Let's figure out how to build a network of support and then if we don't get what we need from our government, we can petition for it. A common concern in many Occupy Boston working groups has been that our government has been hijacked by corporations and moneyed interests, about the unfairness in elections, about how democracy has become a sham, about how they refuse to enroll in a political party. A common concern in, um, excuse me, Occupy groups around the country participated in national strategy calls aimed at prioritizing issues. After four months, hundreds of phone calls, online surveys, and people participating, Getting big money out of our elections emerged as the top issue. And so we started organizing petition network. As we learned how the process worked, we realized that we didn't need to petition if the legislature helped us get the question on the ballot. In fact, the Attorney General of the state of Massachusetts last year in an official document specifically said that the legislature can do this for us. What we're doing will never be accomplished by large organizations who want a pay raise. What we're doing will never be accomplished by large nonprofits that make their money from lobbying. It's going to be accomplished by you and us. 
the people, and we hope you're with us. We prefer not to feel as though we're being forced to go out and get signatures. It's really hard work. We plan to petition anyway because nothing beats the petition process for educating the public and gaining support. Petitioning for this amendment gives us a common cause to build a network of petitioners around the state and it helps us educate the public and build pressure that will help our co-sponsors win the votes necessary in the State House and ultimately by the public. Last year we gathered 12,000 signatures, uh, 90 days, registered voters around the state. Two years ago we were four people, eight people, now we have eight regional coordinators, 30 towns, uh, coordinators in each town, but it's a very high hurdle. We need thousands of people and we only have hundreds. We're not professionals, we're mostly working people who just can't spend all day getting signatures and we need your heart and help. We're committed to continue trying and we feel we have no choice, and our quality has reached historic proportions. The environment is becoming poisoned. Our democracy is crumbling before our eyes, like the people who wrote our constitution, state constitution felt. This very hallowed document could be what saves us. We intend to follow law to challenge moneyed interests from taking over our government. We believe it's the right thing to do. We believe it's our duty. To assist in developing support, we're committed to doing um, legal research on case histories. For example, Jeff Clements, ex attorney, and there's other people helping too, ex assistant <coughs> attorney general for the Commonwealth and co founder of Free Speech for People, which is advocating for U.S. amendments, wrote a nine page memo to Martha Copley supporting our right to put this on the ballot. He opens with, quote, particularly at this time when in the Commonwealth and in the nation a great debate is ongoing about the power of corporations and the assertion of constitutional rights by corporations. This debate should not be foreclosed in Massachusetts if there is sufficient will of the people to bring the question to the ballot." Unquote. Federalists, Federalists who refuse to support us may try to convince you that we have to rely on or wait for Congress or an Article 5 convention to save us. They may claim that what we're doing is illegal, but we have the right to protect ourselves. The federal government possesses only those powers delegated to it by the Constitution. All remaining powers are reserved for the states or the people. If we could not do this, Martha Coakley's office would not have told us in the fall of 2014 in an official letter, quote, a Massachusetts legislature could pursue such an amendment through the legislative process, unquote. As further evidence of... Just to tell you where you are, you're here for six minutes. I am, okay. Um, I have ca other cases. I have other cases, persuasive but not controlling, Professor Lawrence Tribe. I will submit this to you in writing if you'd like. Um, like that. Like thank that. you. So our, threat, our democracy is threatened and we hope you will help us. Um, can I last qu quote with what the Democratic Convention um, endorsed? Okay, so this was the proposal that was endorsed by almost 5,000 delegates to the Con Democratic State Convention last year. Whereas the Massachusetts Constitution's main intent is to promote the common good and strengthen the social compact. Whereas the citizens of Massachusetts are alarmed by the unbridled greed Disrespect for the environment and the audacity of the idea that corporations have any constitutional rights is cause for action. Whereas the citizens of Massachusetts feel that to protect their state, they must embark upon a valid initiative to ensure the governance of their state reflects the people's wishes. Be it resolved that the 2014 Convention of the Massachusetts Democratic Party endorsed past Mass Amendment's valid initiative to amend the state constitution based on corporations and not people, money, not speech. The bill before you is almost the same language tweaked by House Counsel. Thank you. Are, are there questions from members of the panel? Representative Perry, first, and we'll get you to the Thank you. Um, you know, listening to, to sort of your preamble to before you read that, you talked about the, the God given rights, the inalienable rights, versus the uh, rights given by the legislature. But I, I would want to direct your attention to, to, to something that I think is very common. Both unions and um, corporations are actually. Um, regulated by law to some extent, and, and that's followed by the Secretary of the Commonwealth as far as Massachusetts. I know unions and corporations have also national law implications. But in essence, in a, in a corporation, it's owned by its shareholders, uh, if, it's, if it's a stock held company, it's, uh, it's, its owners, if it's not, it's, a, it's board of directors, CEOs, however, the president, however you want to call the administration the ownership of it. Um, they make the decision what they want to do with their profits. Unlike in a union situation, also organized by the Blood of the Commonwealth, um, the members are required to pay. So the members sort of are the owners of the union. But whether they want the administration, the leadership of that to vote a certain way or not vote a certain way, they don't have that kind of discretion. So an employee of a corporation who doesn't have ownership in the corporation 
really, I don't think where they do have the right to tell their bosses who own the company what they can do with their profits. That's their business. But what I have an issue with is people who are members of unions that may not agree with where the union is putting their money. They're paying for it whether they like it or not. And I, I think that the, the concept of corporations not being people, unions are not people either. They're all made up of people, unions and corporations. People make them up. Um, they are run by people. But they have a different structure, and in my opinion, it's almost worse than the union situation because you are paying them to put this money towards some political cause. Whether you agree with it or not, you have no say, but you're required to pay. So I actually find it an even more stricter standard to be, should be really applied to unions than corporations. But in any event, if you just said that neither corporations nor unions were people, they both consist of people or neither of them. I believe uh, Rep. Atkins has a, a little discussion that's going to be based on the shareholder for uh, shareholders. You have shareholders in a corporation, and right now the heads of the corporation are making decisions and not including the shareholders as far as their political contributions. So there's a bill actually out there now that would force the corporation to actually listen to the shareholders. Okay. That makes sense to me. Okay, with a corporation, again, you've got the individuals separated by a wall, a legal wall from the corporation. That does not happen in a union. I'm a local seven island. No, the individuals being the, sh the shareholders or the board of directors or the owners? The board of directors, actually, they're on the corporation side. If they do something as a board of directors, they actually can be held liable, lawfully, whatever. But it's uh, the shareholders, the original investment is protected by that wall. Except for the shareholders get notices of a lot of things the corporations do. They have opportunities to vote on certain things. Um, they can have made somebody be a proxy on their behalf, or if they really don't like it, they can sell their shares and not invest in that company. That's fine, but the shareholder, as you, the point you were trying to make, shareholders also are against what the corporations are doing, and the corporations aren't listening to those shareholders. I don't know that to be true, but... With a union, we run into a democracy. I'm a local seven iron worker. No money is spent without going to the membership and getting a majority of the membership to agree. Same thing in the state house. You might pass bills and not everybody agrees with it. How, how do you deal with, like I said, my friend who is a Republican, who's a teacher, who pays into the teachers' union, but doesn't want to support, like, the Democrats, any other Republican? She doesn't really have a choice. Go someplace where there isn't a democracy. But that's what the unions are well, based I, on. I, I get a different that, job. If you don't like it, then get a different job. I think what she you're doing? She's going. It's a democracy. What you're doing? It's the same with you folks. When, when you do something, yet not everybody agrees with what you're doing. She doesn't have a choice to have her job and not be part of the union. Yes. She's going to voice. Right. She can voice her opinion. Excuse me. Are, are we? Yeah. Do we get the question? Yes. Yeah. I just want to make sure I understand, <coughs> I understand your position. So basically corporations, if, if a corporation is closely held corporation <coughs> wanted to make a political donation of $75,000 to a political action committee or one of these so-called super PACs, whatever they happen to be, your position is that should not be allowed. Is that correct? No, our position is that corporate, the, the bill is corporations are not people and may be regulated. No, my question was real simple. That uh, personally, myself, I'd, I'd like to see money completely out of politics and so just be a debate. So, so, okay. But so this has nothing to do with the bill. The so, bill doesn't so, change any laws or anything. So the next question is, is it okay for unions to put $75,000 into a similar type of pack? As I said, I, I'm all for getting money okay, completely so out of politics. The same. It doesn't matter whether it's corporations or unions. Local 7 has endorsed us, and the same thing I said to them. As far as I'm concerned, I think it would be best for unions to get money completely out of politics. It would be best for them. They have the boots on the ground. So this bill, if it, if it addressed both of those areas, unions and corporations, you folks would support them? Well, most definitely, yes. Okay. The only thing that I don't quite understand is, is you make this comment about you know the liability aspect when you, <clears throat> you go into form corporation you protect yourself from certain liabilities, not urban liabilities, but certain liabilities. Why did, Why would you do that? Why do you think you give up all your other rights? Why are all our other rights given up? Once you set up, I mean, when you buy insurance to protect yourself from a fire, you don't say, I'm going to buy this insurance and I'm going to give up all my constitutional rights to do it. I just don't get the connection between forming a corporation and because you get something back in the form of some kind of limited 
protection or liability in litigation, you also give up all your rights. I just don't quite understand. No, it's it's just it's constitutional rights. And the thing is. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Well, hang on. Can I ask you this? Not all that well trained, but I'm supposed to address the chair and ask if I can speak. But I guess because he's not here, I can go ahead. <laughs> all the fear to occupy. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I can see he take he take over. Okay. So may, may I answer the question? <laughs> well, no, no, I didn't. No, I don't know. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, he, he left it, he just abandoned, abandoned ship. <laughs> okay, thank you. So in his absence... Thank you, oh, I see. Since I get here late, Senator. Sure. And he's back. Well, no, I forgot. The question. <laughs> I was, I was going to answer a question, but then I got fouled up with process, and I couldn't. Actually, what, I, what I'd like to do, if we can, is, is some of these discussions are very direct, and, and I appreciate the activity of both testifying as well as the members. What I might encourage is that you take up the conversation in a more relaxed and casual fashion by, by contact the legislation involved and having that conversation. We only have the room for one oh. before I stop on this today. Yes. We have six more people, uh, including doubles in some, to testify. So really would appreciate it if people would be mindful of holding for five minutes. Uh, obviously, uh, there may be some questions. Thank you. Can I say one thing in closing? Just with all things. Okay. Chairman Fernandez and Chairman Brownsberger and members of the G Committee on the Judiciary. My name is Gina Sonder and I'm a resident of Arlington, Massachusetts, a constituent of Senator Ken Donnelly and Representative Sean Garbley, who both support this bill. Um, I have with me here today Janet Kaysen of Northborough and she is going to read a letter from a constituent of Senator Jalen and Representative Day. Um, and I also have with me today a statement of support for H933 to submit to this committee, which has been signed by 140 citizens. Um, I'm here in the State House today to ensure that my voice and the voices of my fellow citizens who we'll only have our voices and our vote, not access to enormous sums of money, um, are heard on this critical matter. I urge this committee to report favorably on this proposed amendment and allow the legislative process to be carried out by our elected representatives. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, good morning, Chairman and panelists. Um, I'm Janet Kaysen from Northborough, and I'm going to read a statement by Patricia Shepard from Winchester. So I'm, I'm saying that it's written from the first person, but it's her. <laughs> okay. Um, why support House Bill 933? First of all, I want to express my gratitude for the fact that I can come here today in an ordinary, as an ordinary citizen and speak about why I think the state legislature should pass House Number. 933, proposal for a legislative amendment to the uh, Constitution to declare that corporations are not people, money is not speech. This bill deals with the very real possibility that our individual right of free speech is at risk of drowning in the excessive amount of political speech that is increasingly flooding the media, funded by those who have the resources. I imagine that pretty much everyone in this room already knows we have a big problem. Many folks have asked why anyone would attempt to address this issue by amending a, a constitution at the state level. There are, however, advantages to this approach, especially in Massachusetts, Massachusetts which has a long history of self-governance. In fact, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Constitution predates the U.S. Constitution 
by almost ten years and is the oldest functioning written constitution in continuous effect in the world. There is little risk involved if our, if our legislature writes an amendment that best serves Massachusetts and honors the language in the state constitution. If such an amendment is later challenged in court, the case would be based on Massachusetts law, which is relatively strong in these issues. Any progress that Massachusetts makes on this issue could be used as a model for other states, one by one, to gradually create a change in most, if not all, of the, of the, of the United States, as happened in the cases of marriage equality and medical marijuana. The phrase, think globally, act locally, is not just a slogan. It is an attractive plan in this case. Many laws are changed by working from the bottom up through grassroots efforts by folks who feel strongly that something is not right and it must be corrected. I am not a lawyer and I know very little about how to, to write legislation, but it seems to me that if we can figure out a way to do this in Massachusetts, even if it involves testing our new law in the courtroom, we will be closer to finding a better balance between what Lawrence Tribe refers to as our egalitarian polity running alongside our non-egalitarian economy. Thank, uh, thanks for listening and respectfully submitted by uh, Patricia Shepard uh, of Winchester. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, are there questions from members of the panel? Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Um, and, and Paul okay. Donato has, has the, written. the written packet. And, and thank you. And the petition as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got uh, Representative uh, Mr. Bill Lewis of Pass Pass. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, representatives. My name is Bill Lewis. I was most recently a computer scientist at MIT and had the enormous good fortune of being able to teach at both uh, Stanford and Tufts universities. I have worked for many corporations and I am very proud of the work that I have done for them and I'm very proud of the things that those corporations have created, FMC Corporation, Sun Microsystems, Nokia. They have done wonderful, creative, marvelous things which is what corporations are supposed to do. I just don't want them telling me how to lead my life. And so I don't know if this is the best way to establish the fact that democracy is supposed to be about people, but I know that it's in the right direction and therefore I'm putting my efforts into trying to establish here within our commonwealth that corporations are not people and that money is not speech and that we, the people, determine what democracy is and therefore is our right to say that we can limit speech, it's our right to tell corporations what they can do. Because I want to live in a country where the people tell the corporations what they do, not vice versa. And of course, our complaint is that vice versa is what is happening. I was down in uh, West Virginia. You may remember there was a chemical spill into the river system there. And I had the opportunity to spend several weeks driving water to people who were affected by it. I went to church at the most conservative church you can possibly imagine. The preacher got up and he would go up and down the aisle talking about how our God is better than their God. The, the, them Buddhists, they don't know nothing about God. I mean, it was a conservative church. But when I got up and I testified as to why I was there, because a corporation spilled chemicals into the river and nothing happened, half a million people poisoned because the corporation was able to bribe their way out of it. And that's what I don't have happening in my country. So I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but I know that it is the way I want to go, and therefore I'm putting all of my efforts to making sure that we in the co Commonwealth establish that corporations are not people and money is not speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your following this morning. Are there questions from members of the Thank you. My name is Steve Stanganelli, um, a resident of uh, 
Amesbury, Massachusetts. Uh, a little while ago, I was a candidate for a seat for the first Essex district to be where you're sitting. Uh, but I'm, I'm taking the time out of my busy day as a uh, business owner, as a financial planner, and as a tax preparer, to, because this is an important issue to me today. An important issue for the constituency that I uh, ran for to try to represent. And it's an issue that had come up in our district. And I bring it, and I bring my support to this to this bill because I believe that we have tainted our politics at the national level, and we need to protect ourselves at the state level. Ever since Citizens United, you've obviously heard this from others. Uh, we have seen how individual corporations have taken and the idea of individual rights and taken that beyond what I believe the scope of the original Constitution says. It has been said here, and it's true, that uh, corporations are, from a legal sense, an artificial entity created by the state, provided with, those, with, the, with the rights that are provided by you. I own a company. I have an LLC. I have to follow certain rules and regulations. I separate what I do individually from what I do as a business. And that has an impact on, on the message that goes forward. I have certain values as an individual. I certainly would like to have them reflected in how I run my business. I have a small business. But this can ha also happen on a very large scale. We have seen the impact of things like the Hobby Lobby decision of, of, of recently in the Supreme Court, where an individual all part, part of a corporation, an individual owner, has had his values imposed upon that affects all the other people who are part of that corporation, whether they be employees or shareholders. Now, I think that what we are talking about here in terms of free speech is not for corporations. It comes down to very simply this. Outside money distorts the conversation that we have with local voters. Ever since the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Citizens United case, and subsequently the uh, Hobby Lobby decision, more and more dark pools of money have been injected into state races. Someone previously had mentioned how they've seen impact at the local level, whether it be school committees or state legislative races. This has created the potential for distorted conversations and eventual conflicts of interest. Outside money can create a potential conflict of interest and local residents need to know where their elected officials are. And this is a very important issue because money does impact political actions. I, in my professional life, am a financial services representative. I am acting as a certified financial planner as a fiduciary. That means my clients need to know where I stand and I, am on, I have to be representing them. What we have found over the past few years is that this kind of money brought into the kinds of political actions that we see creates a distorted conversation because individuals do not have the unlimited resources of cash. And while individuals have an inalienable right, corporations have a limited right to exist and to have speech. And this particular bill has nothing to say about limiting contractual rights of that corporation to do what it needs to do in commercial speech. I believe, in fact, that uh, in a case in 1985, Harper and Roe versus Nation Enterprises, uh, the court ruled that First Amendment does not prohibit the state from ensuring that the stream of commercial information flow clearly as well as freely. So it does allow the state to have regulatory authority. And one we means of having that regulatory authority is in limitation in terms of the amount of cash in the process. That's what this does, in, in an essence. When the question was said that about a union putting together a $75,000 or $150,000 check, first off, you know where that money is going. It's in a, but what we've seen are 501c4 uh, entities, not just 501c3, and we've seen that money has been dark, undisclosed. And at least this provides ability for the legislature, legislature to actually provide limitations. I know from running a campaign, you do as well, having recently run a campaign, 
that individuals have limitations on how much they can, can contribute. Does not restrict the corporation from doing certain things, doesn't restrict me as an individual candidate to put as much money I want into my own campaign. So the corporation, likewise, would like to have its voice heard in the political arena, and it can still do so. All we're suggesting is that, that they not be, be afforded the same exact rights as individuals. I mean, I think we could take this to the, the uh, ridiculous of the whole thing and say, did we, we allow corporations to have weapons? It is a First Amendment. It is part of the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has talked about, in some ways, allowing corporations in, in, to have le the, the, their religious rights come into effect with the Hobby Lobby decision. It can be wrong. And I believe that we can make that change, and this is what that does. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, are there questions from members of the panel? Thank you very much Thank you. for taking the time. Very much appreciate it. We've got Diane Simpson. Mr. Chair, I'd like to waive my right to appear before this committee because Steve said everything I was going to say, and he said it much more eloquently. Well, that's very uh, thoughtful of you. Um, Uh, I don't, I'm, I am but a humble administrative assistant from St. Paul's Church, so I don't have any uh, adept legal skills to talk about um, the legal ramifications of this bill or any of the things that Steve mentioned. I thought he spoke um, quite eloquently, and I also agree with the lady in red. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Uh, about the moral hazard that this creates for unions as well. I think it's a moral hazard and a double standard and conflict of interest, and I'd like to end there so other people can get a chance to speak. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to turn this over to you, and you, you can choose whether you want to go on with other people on this subject who might be here but have not signed up, or whether you want to pick up everybody in the room. Do you want to say go? Yeah, I just didn't write it on there. Okay, all right. I, I find that kind of private. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll get you. I'm going to excuse myself at this time. Chairman Fernandez, I'm going to I won't even sit down, Mr. Chairman, if you want to wait. <laughs> no, I, you're right. Don't take it personal. <laughs> it's, it's, it's time. I got 1230 meeting. I won't. I'm just kidding. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Raymond McGrath. I'm the Legislative Political Director for the National Association of Government Employees, SEIU Local 5000. Uh, we're here to support the legislation as presented to you for consideration for constitutional amendment. Uh, we all know the purpose and the reason we're here because of actions that have been taken by the Supreme Court of the United States changing various rights and abilities of different people, whether they are human or corporate. Uh, so in the American Constitution, in the, American, in the way government has been uh, established, is uh, there's three parts of government. There's the legislative, there's the executive, and there's the judicial. And each one, his purpose was to oversee the other to ensure the protection of the rights of the, of the, of the uh, citizens. So when one or the other takes an action that's adverse to the other, the other two are responsible, I believe, to take action to reverse the adverse action of the others. And that's what we have with the Supreme Court. They've taken an action that's adverse to the people of the United States, whether you're in a union or not in a union. But they've taken an action that's adverse to the rights of the citizens to address this issue of what is and what is not life, or what is human or what is not free speech. There's been arguments about this particular issue about life for the last 50 years in relationship to pro-life or pro-choice and what is life and what isn't life. But now we want to say that a piece of cement, a building, is a corporation, is life. The, means, the meaning of life, I think, personally. We have an obligation as citizens and as representatives to ensure that the people are protected under these circumstances. Myself, I was a police officer for 33 years, and I took that seriously, that my duty was to protect the people from wrong. 
And I'm sure that you, when you were elected to an office representing your district, that was your duty, was to protect the people from a wrong. And there's two ways to protect it. There's to prevent it, and then it's to change it. You couldn't prevent this, but now you can change it through legislative initiative and change the Constitution. It's fair. As long as it's fairly uh, put upon everyone, it's a fair bill, whether it's a union or whether it's a corporation. As long as we have the same rights, as long as we have the same restrictions and regulations, it's fair. The difference between a corporation and a union is, however, a union is made up of the people, for the people, and by the people. The union is a choice that people make, whether you're a public sector union or you're a private sector union. You don't have to belong to the union in Massachusetts if you're a public employee. It's a myth that you have to belong, that you have to pay. That is not true. The legislature made a differenti differentiation in that. They have what's called a, um, you may choose not to belong to the union, but you have to pay what's called an agency fee. The agency fee's purpose is to ensure that the union protects the rights of that non-member in circumstances of disciplinary actions, of wage increase, wage negotiations, of anything that's going to adversely affect or impact that person at the workplace. We have an obligation by law. In, in the federal government, which we also represent federal employees, we have the same obligation. We just don't have the right to negotiate wages. But we have an obligation to protect the person's ability to earn a living, to maintain a pension, to get benefits like health insurance, to have the opportunity to have a job and not to be politically um, manipulated in the workplace. That's what the union does. It's not there making itself a billion dollars so it can live a luxury life on a boat in the Caribbean. It's about protecting the members. There's a major difference here. And I think the causation of this particular issue is the people. A corporation is not a person. They can't bring 10,000 people into a room where a Democratic Party can have a convention. There's 5,000 people there. Those are people. They're not there to represent anything but their issues. The Republican Party has a convention. They bring 5,000 people to the room. It's the people. They can have no money if they go in the room. It doesn't matter. The problem comes with money. Money is the horror in this issue. Money is the problem when it costs millions and millions of dollars to run to become a national representative. When it costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars to become a state rep or a state senator. It's not right. It needs to be curtailed on both sides. And that's why we support this particular issue. To do the right thing for the people that we represent and hopefully the Commonwealth does the right thing for the people that they represent. And if I could throw in one other quick one, Mr. Chairman. Representative Story filed a bill House 1609. I didn't. I wasn't here. I don't know if she came to explain the purpose, and I haven't had really the opportunity to address it with her. And I will do that. But I would want to put us on record on this particular piece of legislation in in opposition to extending the retirement age for re, for judges. When in the last couple of years we've seen what that has happened throughout the rest of the workforce in the Commonwealth in relationship to retirement ability. And you're actually dealing with that this week in some places. So we would like to file an objection to that, our opposition to House 1609 as well. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yes, Mr. Graff, um, I, I actually was going to try to keep quiet because I know we're under a time crunch, but some of the things you've said, I, I just, I really do have to address. Um, you explained that the difference is that unions are made from people, but you don't want a piece of cement making your decision, I think clearly you would have to agree that corporations
corporations are owned by people. And corporations are not necessarily 10,000 employees. They could be 10 employees. So I don't see that. They are both made of people. The only major difference is a company cannot tell their employees how to vote in a political campaign, nor can they have them pay an agency fee for them to make the decision for them as to how they spend their campaign money. I think that it's either all or nothing. Any groups of people that are organized under the law can either not pay for campaign contributions in their designation as an organization under the law, or only do it as individuals. But you can't have it both ways. You can't say these groups of owners cannot make decisions for themselves, but these groups of owners can. And that's essentially what you're saying. So saying that these union employees don't have to pay dues, they pay a fee. And they pay a fee to the union, and the union has the ability to use the money however they want. And same, but the difference is employees don't pay the corporation. The corporation pays the employees. And the employees have every right to vote any way they want, to send their money anywhere they want, just like those owners that form that corporation, not a piece of cement, make the decision as to how they spend their corporate money. So I thoroughly disagree with your analysis. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Yes. I'll try to be brief. In all due respect, Representative, first of all, the agency fee is regulated by the Commonwealth. And it's only for public employees. It's not for private employees. Nobody has to belong to a union, whether it's public or private. So let's say I was that steel worker here, and he chooses to belong to the steel workers union. He chooses to belong to the steel workers union. The steel workers union doesn't make him belong to it. He chooses to do that. And if you become a police officer, as I was, I choose to join the union if I sign the card. But if I don't sign the card, I have to pay the agency fee. The agency fee protects me for all the benefits that I receive from the union in its negotiations with the community and pension benefits. The difference, however, is that the agency fee is not the same amount that the union uses. And the reason for that is because of exactly what you were just discussing, political contributions. Because if a person is paying an agency fee, the reduction in the one thing that they can actually make a complaint in regards to this is political contributions. And that's why the agency fee is less. I'm the COPE director of our union. And every person that belongs to our COPE is voluntary in our particular union. That's the way we do it. They sign a card to pay into the COPE, additional to their union dues. But those who choose to be agency fee people have the right to question any political contribution made by the union if it includes their due structure. And that's why there's a difference in the amount that's paid. The amount, the differential between what a regular full paying dues person is and the amount that they don't pay is what would be considered the use for political purposes. So the only ones that pay for political purposes are people who pay the full amount of dues. And they pay that voluntarily because they can and they want to. And there's no restrictions on them as far as anything else goes. But that is determined by the legislature. But again, the agency fee is paid with money and you're required to pay that to the union. Whether you say it's to not be used for political use or not, that to me seems even more of an improper situation, shall I say, than an employee of a corporation who doesn't pay their employer. Yeah, but that isn't the point of this law. No, it actually is because the person who is going to be sending the money to a political campaign at the top of a corporation is the owner of a corporation. They're not taking their money from their employees to do it. The union is still an entity that is going to take the money that is going to be from members that pay into it in order to make that decision. And I say, would you agree that if you're going to say that corporations are not people, even though they're made up of people, then unions are not people, even though they're made up of people? Well, unions are people made up of all the people in the union who have a voice. Corporations are made up of boards of directors and the employees don't have a voice. 
the day the workers. The owners have it, exactly. Right, that's who's making the donations. You're making it from their profits, not from the employees. From the corporation's profits. And they own the corporation. They'd be better served paying the employees okay, more. <laughs> Take the money and give it to the employees, like that guy in California just did. Thank you, sir. Um, are there other questions uh, this afternoon? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, we have one other person who, who signed up to testify. If there's anybody else who wants to testify that didn't sign up, can you raise your hand, please? Just one person. Um, Paul Donato has a sign up sheet. If you wouldn't mind just filling out the sheet so we'll just have the proper information. Okay, um, I, I want to thank the panel for allowing me to speak and listening to me. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is David Rold. I live in Weston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the state committee of the Green Rainbow Party, which, which supports this idea of amending the um, Massachusetts Constitution to, to state that corporations are not people and money is not speech. And um, I'm also an anti-war activist. I'm, I'm mainly going to speak as an anti-war activist, is that I'm, I'm concerned about um, the role of um, money, of contributions from um, from weapons manufacturing companies and military contractors in um, determining um, the policies of both the national and state governments regarding wars and military expenditures and, and um, what we say about foreign countries. Um, one, one example is that in, in 2011, when the um, United States and NATO intervened militarily in Libya, um, there were 159 um, Raytheon Tomahawk missiles, missiles made by, by Raytheon that cost $1.4 million each that were, that were shot at targets in Libya. But when we, um, when the during the political debate about about this war in Libya, there was no talk about is this going to benefit Raytheon and make hundreds of millions of dollars for Raytheon. The the discussion was about like humanitarian considerations, and so we we miss this what this going on in the background that there are corporations making hundreds of millions of dollars from from military actions, but. Um, but they don't, we don't talk about it. We talk about national, as if it's all about national security and humanitarian concerns. Um, I, I know like a lot of Massachusetts congressmen are like, take thousands of dollars of donations from Raytheon. And to, to bring it back to something that when it happened in Massachusetts, and in 2007, I testified in the Gardner Auditorium against a Massachusetts bill to um, divest from Sudan, which was really symbolic since there was no investment in Sudan. It was just basically a statement where the Massachusetts legislature like, said that, accused the government of Sudan of genocide, said they're a bad country. And, um, so I, I testified against that because I didn't agree with the, the characterization of the government of Sudan and what this would this bill would do. But what I didn't know at the time is that lot is that at the same time that this debate about divestment from Sudan was going on in the in this state house, Lockheed Martin was negotiating with the UN to get a $250 million contract to build infrastructure for UN peacekeeping troops in, in Darfur. So I, I, so it, like there were millions of dollars spent on the campaign in Massachusetts to get Massachusetts to divest from Sudan, and some of that money could have come from Lockheed Martin to influence Massachusetts to do that because it, if a state in the United States like takes a position against a country that is going to influence the the federal government and the UN to, to possibly take military action there. So I'm I'm concerned that we need a way to um, to regulate um, what weapons manufacturers and military contractors their donations so that we don't have situations where where large military contractors are 
like spending money to get Massachusetts involved, the Massachusetts government involved in, in foreign policy like that in order to, to benefit them. Like the, the conversations about, about policy and expenditure should be based on its benefit to people and not the voice of people with of like corporation owners with millions of dollars shouldn't be amplified so much. That shouldn't be what determines policy. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from members Thank you very much. Representative Colby, the chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Very excited to be here just a few moments ago. I enjoyed that very much. <laughs> so, uh, I have a 45 minute diatribe on House Bill 1343. So, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm just here to speak to you uh, and to the members. I want to say thank you very much for taking the time for taking me out of turn. Uh, House Bill 1343, an act relative to the removal of judges, may sound uh, something that is uh, very aggressive, but it's something that has come to my attention uh, not being a lawyer, not being an attorney. Um, many of the folks in my area are looking for another way to get the attention of the, the judiciary. Uh, there are current uh, provisions in our MGLs right now under, under Chapter 211 to have this done. The folks that I represent, or some of the folks that I represent, are looking at this in just a different way to try to see if we should maybe engage uh, the Governor's Council. The seven years that I, just, that I talk about in the legislation, it could be nine. It's just a point of discussion. It really truly is, Mr. Chairman, and I know that your uh, committee will look at this, will take a good hard look, and I know that each, one, each and every one of you have probably looked at what the Founding Fathers have uh, talked about, about our judiciary, how we hold them in the highest esteem, and we should hold them in the highest esteem. But as we all know, this is an opportunity uh, that might uh, assist in checks and balances, and that's what my constituents have asked me to do, and that's why I'm here today. So uh, if there are any other questions on House Bill 1343, I'd, I'd gladly speak to you today on the floor later on when we talk or uh, privately whenever you would like, Mr. Chairman, or through you to any of the committee members. Thank you. Any questions from well, Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. And the entire committee. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one other person, uh, Rachel Ann Wartis. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm kind of a shorty kind of presenter. No. <laughs> and I like to read because I haven't gotten good at ex being extra extemporary. Use the microphone to make sure you can hear it. What's that? Use the microphone so okay. you can hear it. I, I want to talk about the um, business of corporations being, quote, people from a language perspective. These days, language is being relativized so that children in school can argue that 5 plus 1 equals 7. This means the facts of the mechanical reality are being obfuscated so that we don't know where we stand in the material reality. That's permitting all kinds of misunderstandings to take place and hidden, hidden, hidden agendas to manifest. I am certain that it is critical for society to operate with accurate language if it is to flourish. It should be obvious corporations are not people and thus should not be labeled as people, a matter of integrity that permits and supports life, life's activities. So that's, that's why I would, that's the basic reason I would support House 911, 933. Also, I'd like to make some comments on corporations. Recently, I happened to um, research why the CEOs are paid so highly, like millions of dollars, nine, ten million dollars. So I came across an article by somebody who had been an owner in a corporation. I don't remember the specific corporation, in which he maybe had three or five percent of the ownership of the corporation. And he tried to, um, to affect, reduce the pay of the corporate CEO because he thought that's a lot of money. And that kind of pay that goes to the CEOs comes out of the pockets of the corporate owners. So the owners are not that much more powerful 
unless they have huge percentage of ownership than, say, uh, union members. So I just like to point out that corporations are generally power, um, power centers, concentrated powers in which the board of directors, the person most powerful on the board of directors, and the CEOs um, manage the corporations. And you're lucky if you get some money off, but if you're an owner, I guess. So that's basically what I'd like to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. We've got everybody who intends to testify today. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, in light of that, we will take the matter under advisement and hold the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for putting your time in and being our rep. Thank you. Ready?